Let's just give the Lord another hand of praise. Press in and worship for another moment. Stay standing, if you will, for a minute. If you're hungry, lift your voice. Lift your voice unto God. Shout unto God. Let him know how hungry you are. Hallelujah. 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 We love you. Take 15 seconds and lay your hand on your neighbor and pray for your neighbor right now. Pray for your neighbor to receive and lift your voice. Pray for your neighbor to receive everything that God has for them in this moment. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We break off all enemy attack in the name of Jesus. We pray that our neighbors, that our friends, that our loved ones will receive everything you have for them in this moment. Hallelujah. Take 15 seconds. Put your hand on yourself and pray for yourself. Pray that you will receive all that Holy Spirit has for you in this moment. Place your hand on your heart and your head. I thank you, Lord, for the breakthrough that's going to take place. I thank you, Lord, if the attack that has happened this week is any indication. I thank you for the mighty breakthrough that's going to take place in our lives today. Hallelujah. 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 Take 15 seconds and put your hand this way and pray for me, please. Pray for the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Pray for the messenger. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, let me be your mouthpiece. Holy Spirit, I'm your humble vessel. Speak today, Lord. Speak today, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give him a shout of praise. Woo! Thank you, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. morning with Alan's session. So wrecked. I mean, I've had this message ready for a couple of weeks and Corey, Alan, me, we're just all this. God is speaking. He's saying the same thing, the same thread this weekend. You may be seated. And I don't know, raise your hand if you had some serious, intense spiritual attack over the last week or two. Woo! That's about all of us. Oh, buckle up. Buckle up. Hallelujah. It's an honor to be here with you today. I want to thank Jeremiah and Morgan and the team. Give it up for this whole team. Listen, no team works harder than this team. I live in the same community with them, and this is not a job for them. This is a way of life, yeah. and I honor them. In fact, could the whole team, altar, global, school, whatever, stand to your feet. We want to pray for you right now. Everyone serving with the ministry, if you'll just stand. Volunteers, whoever you are, let's, let's stretch our hands toward them right now. And we bless you right now in the name of Jesus with greater anointing richer oil, deeper consecration, greater provision, signs and wonders flowing through you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bless you. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? amen. Mm. I just keep seeing a pressure cooker. This is a pressure cooker. Your worship and your intercession is building up. It's building up pressure, your prayers, your sacrifice. It's creating a pressure. You're getting cooked to perfection. I'm talking to this team right now, the entire team, everyone serving. You're getting cooked to perfection, and he's marinating you so that you can put off such a sweet aroma and feed the multitudes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We invite you here. So yeah, I just want to bless Jeremiah. Um, the child, my children and I laugh that uh, Jeremiah always shows up in our life in the most pivotal prophetic moments. Um, talk about like creepy prophet vibes, you know? <laughs> 
seriously, like he just kind of shows up out of nowhere and, and gives us words that just wreck our lives and rock us and ac accuracy is incredible. Um, he was in our home, this is, gosh, 2019, I guess. This is before he had moved the ministry here and we're local here. And so Jeremiah was in our home and, um, and the Lord delivered several words through him to us that really were, um, it was just an incredible hinge moment for us. And man, have they come to pass? Totally, absolutely. And then um, Jeremiah asked me to come share in Florida when he had the ministry school there in Florida, and that was a wonderful time. But what stands out to me um, in that time was not my ministry time, but it was actually when we went out to eat with he and Morgan afterwards it, with my adult daughters. And the way Jeremiah fathered in that moment, my adult daughters, as we were going through some, some really challenging things, and, uh, you know, there was a time when I was getting weird phone calls from the Trump White House asking me to come and, and be a voice there. And, you know, I had Jeremiah on speed dial to pray for me and he would cover me in prayer. Um, and so I just I honor them and I honor my pastors here um, who uh, Pastor Fall and Pastor Luke and McLean Fall. They're not in the room because they six months ago they had their pastor's meeting scheduled for today. But uh, I honor that house. Joy Church is our home church. And uh, I do have some books. If y'all look back there in the corner in that room is the actual book room. Um, I have recently written a pro-life children's book called Little Lives Matter. And it is a beautiful love story about a one-armed bear um, who who is, well, I won't, I won't go into all of it, just say that it's a, a beautiful love story, a beautiful pro-life book and illustrated and your kids are going to love it. So go ahead and avail yourself of that if you are interested. So let's dive in. Um, look, I, I don't come as a seminary graduate or a, um, a pastor or anything. I come as a mom of, of 10 children. Here's my babies right here on the front row. Amazing humans. <laughs> we'll take you too, Jake. <laughs> but uh, yes, they are all mine. I, I did birth them. No, there are no twins. And yes, I did know what causes it, if you're wondering. <laughs> so, but you know, the books, the speaking, that's not my credentials. This is my credentials right here. Being their mom is what I consider to be my greatest credential in life. And today I believe the Lord has asked me to share with you about the oil of intimacy that is produced through suffering and sacrifice. <laughs> I was on the phone with Lisa Bevere just yesterday and she said, you might want to change that message because <laughs> she says, God always does to me whatever I am preaching about. And I said, well, I can't do that. I believe that's what I'm supposed to share. The oil of intimacy that is produced through suffering and sacrifice through the battle, through tribulation, through the fire, not after the tribulation has passed, but in the fire. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The miracle, the fourth man in the fire did not show up after their trial, but in their trial. We cannot gaze so much at our circumstances and what we are going through in this moment that we're actually missing that the fourth man in the fire is right there with us through it all. Can I get an amen? He's looking for a sacrificial bride. I'm more convinced than ever. It's not the preachers in lights that have his attention, that heaven is watching. In fact, on May 21st, I had a dream. I dreamed that I was actually, I've never told Jeremiah this. I had a dream that I was in an upper room with Jeremiah. And he said he had a very heavy word to give to one of my daughters. And I went and got my daughter and I shared the word, he shared the word with her. And the gist of it was that God was going to give her grace to carry the heavy intercessory burden that she is carrying, which is very accurate. And grace to carry it and soar above like a heron. I'm just telling you what my dream was. 
And then he said, she's called not to the pretty and important people on the earth, but to the people who are close to the throne and to God's heart and important in heaven. Then the dream immediately switches to a man in India being burnt on a stake. And he's ministering the gospel as flames are lapping up around his feet. And God was saying, this is who my eye is on. This is what has me leaning forward. Are you ready for the sacrifice? Are we really stewarding the gospel and living sold out for the gospel, even as the flames are lapping up around our feet, the trials, the troubles, the challenges of life? If you want fire on the altar, there's going to have to be a sacrifice. We spent too many years thinking that Jesus died for a good debate team. He didn't die for a debate team. For people that can just talk. For people that can just convince people of things. For people that can impress you with how much knowledge they have. He died for lovers. He didn't die for employees who punch in and punch out. He died for a bride. Can I get an amen? And I believe the Lord, the theme of this entire weekend, it's called Midnight Oil, but I think the consistent theme here is that we are speaking to people who may find yourself in a valley of pain and tribulation today. But guess what? David did not defeat Goliath on a mountaintop. Where did he defeat him? In a valley. (laughs) In a valley. And if I've done my job today, I believe some of us are going to enlist in this battle like never before and lay down our entitlement to an easy life. And some may even de-enlist. Some may decide, oh, this is not what I signed up for to take up my cross daily and follow him. I did sign up for a better life. There's a reason that God likens our walk with him to a battle, a race, a war, right? (laughs) Why didn't he call it, oh, a tiptoe through the tulips? Why didn't he call it a walk in the park? It's always battle analogy because it's not a walk in the park, right? It's not tiptoeing through the tulips. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. We wrestle not against people, but we are in a spiritual battle. No question about it. When children don't know if they're a boy or a girl, we are in a war. When mommies don't know if they're going to keep their baby or kill their baby, we are in a war. Why is it that coaches study game tape and understand their opponent and equip themselves for their opponent's tactics, but when we get pushed back, we say, well, I got resistance. This must not be God. Mm. Are we really reading the same Bible? The people that say, oh, well, there was resistance. Must not be God. Jacob wrestled all night with God to get his blessing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to choose to stand up when everybody else bowed down. And even though they did the right thing, still had to go through the trauma of being thrown into the fire. They came out unhinged. It took a minute. (laughs) But somebody say, God always wins. He always wins. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 12, 5. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with the horses? The Lord wants to bring us to a higher place where we can keep up with the horses. God, grant us grit. Grant us endurance. I pray we would have grit like Esther. That even though her backstory was that she was an orphan, 
She ascends to the throne. She calls a national fast. She risks everything, the crown and even her life. Outs the king's closest leader. Sees him hung on the gallows and then saves an entire people group. Come on, somebody. Esther did not come to play, right? She might have looked cute, but you don't come against her people group. You don't unleash a demonic death decree over her people, not on her watch, right? Let's not be discouraged. Let's not be fadeless. Jesus said, occupy until I come. We have a gospel to preach. We have work to do. And I just think that there are people in the room who are on the precipice of wavering, wavering, throwing in the towel. The enemy is trying to wear us out. I've had a crushing, bone crushing two weeks. The enemy is trying to wear us out. He will discourage us, intimidate us, try to scare us. But how many know God actually used Goliath to get David to the throne? God used Goliath to get David to the throne. You're going through hell and back right now. God's going to use the crushing to produce oil in you. And the place of your pain is going to be the place of your ministry. <laughs> we know the story of, I, thank you. I love the feedback. I love a loud room. All right. We know the story of the virgins. The, the conference is called Midnight Oil. Five foolish who wanted to borrow from the five wise. But what the virgins learned, and it's probably already been said in the conference, is that you cannot borrow a person's sacrifice. My kids can't borrow my sacrifice or my history in God. And I can't borrow theirs. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could. I have a son who recently just gave away and sold everything he had and left everything that he loved to follow Christ. I can't have that. I can't have his oil. It can inspire me, and it does. I have an adult daughter who has done epic food fasts that I couldn't even fathom enduring. And I can't borrow that from her. I'm not talking about a striving because God loves all of us. Okay. We're in relationship with him. So I'm not talking about that, but if you want the oil, it's going to require some sacrifice. In a recent interview I did with Alan Hood, who just was incredible this morning. He said the single defining characteristic of the apostles was how well they suffered. Not their networking, not their charisma, but their ability to suffer with him. And I just find that so few want to talk about this part, right? It doesn't get you a bunch of likes and big offerings to talk about enduring suffering. But I believe people are miscarrying their destinies because they have not been equipped for this part of the battle. As it says in Mark 4, 17, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, they immediately stumble. Oh yeah, they were excited at first, but here comes the pressing, here comes the crushing, here comes the persecution. They weren't ready for it and they stumbled. They thought Jesus was gonna be their ATM, their genie in the bottle, their full body makeover. And they got hit, slapped with a dose of life. And they stumble, the Bible says. So red alert. <laughs> I'm, I'm warning you now that there, it, there are trials. There is tribulation. Corey Russell says Jesus got into eternity through a crucifixion. Why do we think it'll be any different with us? Yeah. 
You know, we're so good at finding the devil in suffering and blaming the devil in our suffering. But who will find God in their suffering? This is what everyone has been saying so far in this conference. Who will press in and find God in your suffering and reach for God in your pain? Don't push him out in your pain. Pull him into your pain. I'm going to say that again. Don't push him out in your pain. Pull him into your pain. Oh, he meets us there so powerfully. He softens us. He tenderizes us. Nothing softens us like suffering if we are willing to endure. If we are willing to surrender to the Lord in it. You know, it'll do one or the other. It'll make you bitter. <laughs> if you don't pull God into your pain, it'll make you as bitter and brittle as a cracker. Or it will tenderize you. And you will give off such a beautiful fragrance of oil. This is one of the dangers of getting out of balance with the gospel. We don't want to fall into a ditch on either side. Okay? We don't want to get out of balance with the gospel where the focus is always on prosperity and being victorious and living our best life. Now, I am 100% for the victorious life. I am 100% pressing in and praying you know, for signs and wonders and prosperity and all of that. But we must teach this next generation how to endure hardship. What does the Bible say? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Are there any soldiers in the room? Come on. The Lord's preparing us. You know, and I've heard a false idea that God doesn't really test us. Anybody heard that? That just this kind of idea that that's a stinky thought that God would actually test us. I've had people say that to me when I'm sharing with them something that's going on in my life. And, and uh, I'm just saying, man, God's preparing me for something, you know, and I'm finding God in it. And they look at me like I have two heads and they're like, how could God be in this? Like, this is the devil. This is demonic. And I think it comes, this, this idea that God's not in suffering comes from James 1.14 that says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So God does not tempt us, certainly. But in the same chapter, guys, in James 1 and verse 2, it says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The what of your faith? The testing of your faith. So God does not tempt us, but you better believe God tests us. What kind of parent wouldn't test a child before giving them a much greater responsibility, before putting them behind a wheel of a car? God didn't give David Goliath until he had killed a lion and a bear. We go through tests in this life. There's a reason Moses and the children of Israel did not get to just pole vault the Red Sea. There's a reason. Oh my gosh. That was just a crushing moment. Have you ever thought about the trauma of that moment? Standing there and you got to see on one side and you've got this army behind you and they're going to destroy you. Have you ever thought about the trauma that they endured in that moment? Anybody here ever been through some trauma? Let me see your hands. Yeah, most of us. All right. You, you remember it vividly. And imagine the trauma. God needed them to go through that. There's a reason Jesus didn't get to pull out the cross. To get to the crown. We know God could have done it that way, right? There's a reason. Somebody shout, there's a reason. There's a reason. Oh, shout it like you believe it. There's a reason. There's a reason. Woo! The desert is where our character is produced. The cross is where our character is produced. This place of suffering you might find yourself in right now. And don't minimize what you're going through. Say, oh, I'm not being burned on a stake. Don't minimize that. What you're doing with what you're going through in your life right now is beautiful to God. 
It means something to him. He smells it. He smells your sacrifice of praise. He smells your worship. Mm. So I, I just find it interesting that people say that, that you know, God is, is not, you know, he's not into suffering. I mean, Jesus was a man of what? Sorrows <laughs> acquainted with grief. Again, this ain't going to go well on Instagram and Facebook. You know, this, this ain't going to get 10,000 likes on social media. Okay. But this is what I believe the Lord would have me share. Moses suffered. Joseph, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, apostles. If Jesus needed the process of the desert, I need it times a hundred. Anybody else? Absolutely. Hallelujah. Lord, prepare us. Lord, equip us. Mm. Hallelujah. Let's take a few seconds right now. Let's just pray. Lord, let me be ready. Let me be ready. Equip me. We invite you, Lord. We invite you, Lord, to strengthen us, to run with the horsemen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of y'all are literally considering aborting your calling. Dialing it back. Because you've been watching enough televangelists who are telling you that it's about the big, big money blessing, right? And you're like, well, this just doesn't work. This just doesn't work. I've been praying. I've been praying. And, and my prayers are not working because you think that God is not in your pain. And he's there. He's right there with you. The fourth man in the fire. And I came to encourage you today that when you are going through a desert season, you are in the sweet spot, just like Jesus was in the desert. You are in the staging ground for the next season of your life, which is going to be incredibly powerful as you share the oil that was produced in that desert time. Jesus said in Matthew 7, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Difficult is the way. <laughs> that's, that's what it says. Some translations say difficult is the way. High five somebody and say, I must be on the right way. <laughs> but where are the, the health and wealth prosperity preachers on this verse when Jesus says, the way is difficult. You see this flawed teaching also causes a lack of vulnerability amongst us with one another. We become closed off from one another and we're embarrassed to share with our brothers and sisters how we are suffering and what we are going through because we're concerned that they're going to judge us. Like the Pharisees judged the um, young man who was blind. Remember they said, oh, you know, what sin have you committed? <laughs> And so we don't open up, we don't share, and we need one another in this hour. Let's not treat our brothers and sisters who are suffering like lepers. They're not lepers any more than Jesus was a leper. So I want to share a few principles before we go into altar, uh, our altar ministry time that I believe are going to help you overcome and produce oil in your suffering. Just a few quick principles. I know we all want to alleviate our suffering, guys, but this company, this bride right here, even when she's suffering and in pain, she's going to produce oil. That's what God is looking for in his end time bride. Principle number one, humble yourself and don't take matters into your own hands. Let him fight your battles for you. One of the primary processes that God works righteousness and growth in us, guys, is through hard situations of betrayal. Anyone here ever experienced the pain of betrayal, ended relationships? I want to plead with you in a moment of betrayal, don't become a Saul and start throwing javelins. Be a David. What did David do? He went deep into the bridal chamber. 
deep into the bridal chamber to sit with and worship the only one who can comfort him, God himself. I was talking to Lou Engle recently, and he was sharing with me some betrayal moments in his life, and I was sharing the same with him. And, you know, Lou didn't ask me when we were talking, what did, you know, what did you do wrong to find yourself in this situation? <laughs> Lou said, yep, that sounds about right. <laughs> I wish I could do his voice. I, I can't. I think I would choke if I tried to do a Lou Engle voice. <laughs> But that's what he said. He said, yep, that sounds about right. Then he said, where great impact and victory is around the corner, always watch for betrayal. Did you hear that? Where great impact and victory is around the corner, always watch for betrayal. Don't let it catch you by surprise. Then he said, wounds are windows into your future. Mm. Come on, I think of Joseph so deeply wounded by his brothers. Those wounds were windows that led Joseph into his amazing future, right? Because he stewarded them and didn't let them grow into a root of bitterness. Oh man, we're going to come up. We're going to come against a root of bitterness up in here today. For sure. I think of David wounded and hunted to his death by Saul, who he faithfully served. Oh, the pain of that. Mm, God will go to war against your enemies, guys. Deuteronomy 28, 7. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated in front of you. Can I get an amen? When you live for him, he will fight for you. You don't have to do it for yourself. Shoot. Man, we serve the God who specializes in flipping the script like he did for Daniel, who was in the lion's den, and then his enemies ended up in the lion's den. Like he did for Esther. They made gallows for for, uh, Mordecai. They end up hanging on him. Mm. And one thing I've noticed, you know, and if I could go back over my life, things that I'd want to redo are moments where... I fought for myself. I fought the battle for myself instead of letting God fight for me. Those are moments I would redo. I've noticed that water flows to the lowest places first. Right? We want the living water to flow through us. We got to go low, guys. We got to humble ourselves. We don't have to defend ourselves like our beautiful King Jesus. Let him do it for you. He does it better. The living water is looking for those who are humble enough that he can flow through them. He will pluck you. If you are a humble vessel, he will pluck you out of whatever situation you are in and put you in places you never asked for and never dreamed of being. Next, in order to produce oil in a season of pain and suffering, we must ascend. We must ascend higher. We must ascend the noise and the clatter of this age, the voices that are discouraging you, that are lying, that are gossiping and slandering. We must not listen to the people's voice, but to God's voice. Think about Moses. What would have happened if Moses had not ascended that mountain and heard directly from God Almighty? And if he was listening to the whining and the chatter and the criticism, there is an invitation to all of us guys to ascend higher above the noise. Ephesians 2, 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We sit in heavenly places. Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. I get it. I mean, you're saying she doesn't know what I'm going through, you know, like If I sat here and told you what I'm going through right now, you would not be leaving. Your jaw would drop. I am not preaching this message 
from a place of not understanding how hard this is to ascend higher than the circumstances that you are enduring and facing. Mm. I think of 2 Kings 6, Elijah's servant was scared of the enemy army. And Elisha says, do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with him. And Elijah prays for the servant to see what he is seeing. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw that the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Oh God, wreck our vision where we only see what's going on in the here and now and give us your vision right now, Lord. Let us ascend, God, to a place where we hear your voice and we're carriers of your voice. And the last principle I want to share, I, I promise you, I had this already before Alan and Corey got up here and they literally both talked about birthing. But guess what? I think I have a little more authority on birthing than they do. <laughs> <laughs> if I do have creds on anything in this room today, it would be childbirth, okay? So, and oh my gosh, this is huge. This is huge in our walk with God. We have to surrender to the process, let go, yield, and don't fight the contractions that we are experiencing in our life. Okay, for the men in the room who don't know what I'm talking about, I've had um, 10, 10 home births, okay? The last one, the 10th, um, ended up the last hour in, in the hospital, and I'm going to tell you why. So... And let me tell you, by the ninth of the tenth, you're pretty traumatized, okay? <laughs> like, you are so done. <laughs> and uh, it gets trippy in your head. But on the, I don't know, probably the eighth, um, I remember that I, I did not want, oh no, someone came in to my birth that distracted me. And I felt like I needed to kind of host them or accommodate them. Um, not literally host, but I'm just saying, like, I'm a host. I'm a host through and through, a hostess. And so I just felt like I needed to kind of be a certain way with him in the room. And I literally stalled my birth. You can, I mean, we're talking about the full force of childbirth going on. And if you get too distracted on things that God does not want you focusing on, you can actually stall your labor and what God wants to birth in you. Don't get distracted. Some of y'all are thinking real hard right now about that. Don't get distracted. And on my 10th, um, I, I just had gotten all the way through it. I'd been in 14 hours of labor and it's your 10th. So that's really discouraging because you're like, this is my 10th. Why is this taking so long? And so I was in a really bad headspace and not coping well. And the way you bring forth birth is you, the best way to bring forth birth is to relax and open up and allow what God wants to do in you, allow that baby to come through. If you fight the contractions, if you tense up and, and do not surrender to the contractions, you can stall your labor. And I just couldn't get in the headspace to bring the baby forward. And I, I ended up saying, I gotta go to the hospital. And so I went to the hospital and I said, honey, you giving me an epidural right now. All right, I done this. I done this so many times. We getting some meds. I ain't never had med in a labor before. We do it. Somebody do the epidural praise dance with me. Has anybody in here had an epidural? Woo, honey, that was good. <laughs> So yes, they gave me the epidural, and I mean, poof, labor over. I mean, the baby was coming. I was so tense saying no to what needed to happen that it could not happen until I could no longer feel the what was happening. Okay? This is a 
principle in the kingdom that the more you fight it, the more it hurts and the longer it takes. We need to receive what God is doing and work with him to bring transition and to not stay in this funk of being in fear and anxiety and tense and fighting it and resisting what he's doing. We need to welcome what God is wanting to do through us. Can the worship team and ministry team go ahead and come down now? Here's, here's, the, here's the exciting part, guys. All right? The exciting part is that suffering unlocks our inheritance. Did you know that? Suffering unlocks our inheritance. Romans 8, 17. I mean, if you got your Bible, turn, on, turn to this one. Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So here we are, his children. We are heirs. This is good news, guys, right? Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If what we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Who wants some more glory up in here today? Come on. It's an equation. Let's do some math, guys. The suffering you're enduring is producing glory in your life. Yes. Mm. Man, I got so wrecked this morning when, um, when Alan said, you know, we're going to live for all eternity with the Lord without suffering. This is the only time we get to love God in our suffering. I am not going to have any excuse after hearing that. <laughs> it's just like he just ripped every excuse out of my whining mouth. Right? What an honor. What an honor to take this life and the pain that it brings to us sometimes and to worship God and remain faithful to him in it. Stand to your feet, if you will. What would you think of me? I got this analogy from um, John Newton, who uh, God saved after being a, a despicable slave trader. God radically saved John Newton. And I'll modernize this analogy. Um, but he says, what would you think of me if I'm driving to an appointment to inherit $100 million? Okay? And my car broke down. And I spent one mile walking to my final destination where I'm about to receive how much? Woo, honey, shout it out. 100 million. And the whole time I'm crying, poor me, look at me, having to walk a mile to get to my... How strange. What a temporary mindset. What a lack of ability to see the long game. We need to get back to an eternal mindset. This life is not the event. <laughs> this is our mile lap. This is not the event. Eternity is the event. Oh, and what we have in store for us. Hallelujah. Mm. God is king and his bride is always win, always wins and I want to invite you into an invitation right now to renew our commitment to suffer well with him today to sacrifice and to keep our eyes steadfastly on the prize of eternity and live a humble life that is pleasing to him. 
Jeremiah in 20, what was it, 2020, when you went through just a bone crushing season where you had the whole public apology thing and all everything that, that came out of that. Did you feel like you were going to die or, you know, just like lose everything? Yes. Did your response to that pain birth what we see here today? Yes. Could you see it when you were going through it, that this is what was, oh, hmm. I mean, that interesting. <laughs> now, why would God show him? How would God develop that muscle in him? Right. If he had shown him just what Alan was talking about today. Yeah. <laughs> would you go through that pain again to produce what it produced? He says yes. He says yes. God does not let us see what he is doing in our pain for a reason. It would remove faith from the equation. These altars are open. Your name's Preston, right? Preston's going to lead us in a time of worship. There's an invitation today to renew our commitment to suffer well with Him, to renew our commitment to take this life that we have been given and to thank Him and to ascend and keep our eyes on Him and to humble ourselves and trust Him to fight this battle for us.